Looks like Russia has declared the petrodollar to be the NITU dollar. Russia's largest oil company Rosneft has set the euro as the default currency for all new exports of crude oil and refined products, as the state-controlled giant looks to switch as many sales as possible from US dollars to euros in order to avoid further US sanctions against it. Rosneft is the biggest oil exporter from Russia, selling around 2.4 million barrels per day of oil. According to Reuters estimates that's around $4 billion a month that will no longer be transacted in dollars. Roughly 3% of daily oil trade. Not a huge matter, but it is just one company. Good for the Russians. Besides, why do you need to trade in dollars, when most of your energy export trade goes to Europe anyway? It's best and far more logical to be dealing in euros, or something that has more tangible value like gold, instead. I have insider information that Gazprom is about to do the same and ditch the dollar. Russia is just the beginning. This will only increase with the One Belt One Road project. Russia knows the US dollar global financial system is a fraudulent criminal enterprise run by parasitic murderers. I expect to see more of these moves in the future. Imagine Saudi gets taken offline with Iran, Syria, Iraq, Venezuela and Russia selling off the petrodollar. Weaponize the dollar and people start using other currencies to get around it. Being the reserve currency is a privilege, abuse it and the world will ever so slowly year by year move away from it via digital currencies and other currencies. Threats of using SWIFT as a weapon will also result in countries finding other ways of settling accounts. When you weaponize a currency, countries will run from it like. It can kill your economy. America has abused its privilege. All fiat currencies expire. History is littered with failed currencies. The problem for the Fed and the debt-ridden US economy is that it cannot stand any loss of dollar funding or debt expansion. When Saudi Arabia starts taking euros, the sheet is really going to hit the fan. The USA did all it could for this to happen. It is well deserved. By slamming 60% of the world with sanctions America is driving the world off the dollar and into alternatives, but this only screws Uncle Sam faster. Accomplished by the same geniuses that killed Saddam and made Iran the only power left in in that important region. We already blew our swift card and now alternatives are in place. The de-dollarization is accelerating. Most US citizens don't realize a world of de-dollarization hurt is coming our way. The US seems to have exhausted its power. They overextended and the blowback will be enormous. Bye bye petrodollar. Sovereign nations, big or small, simply do not cuddle up to vassalage. Especially when the empire is corrupt, immoral and ridiculously depraved. Trump may have his deplorables, but the US political system has its degenerates, engaged in an absurd theater of contempt and division, as they promote fraud, totalitarianism, transgenderism, pedophilia and Wall Street's global crime syndicate under protection of the dollar system what an example to lead by, and for the citizenry to pay fealty to in their income tax extortion. What a perfect example of how not to be for the rest of the world to see. The orange buffoon must be scratching his head and asking his cabinet members what de-dollarization means and whether he can still call it winning. We all know what academic imposters, brainless neocon loonies have to say. Welcome back to the Atlantis Report. You are here for your daily dose of the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Please take a second to hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button, and don't forget to also hit the notification bell. Thank you. The Iranian regime and the Saudi Arabian regime are longtime enemies, with both vying for control of the Persian Gulf region. Part of the conflict stems from religious differences, differences between Shia and Sunni Muslim groups. But much of the conflict stems from mundane desires to establish regional dominance. For more than 40 years, however, Saudi Arabia has had one important ace in the hole in terms of its battle with Iran. The US's continued support for the Saudi regime. But why should the US continue to so robustly support this dictatorial regime? Certainly, these close relations can't be due to any American support for democracy and human rights. The Saudi regime is one of the world's most illiberal and anti-democratic regimes. Its ruling class has repeatedly been connected to Islamist terrorist groups, with foreign policy magazine last year calling Saudi Arabia, the beating heart of Wahhabism, the harsh, absolutist religious creed that helps seed the worldviews of Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State. Saudis behind the petrodollar. 
The answer lies in the fact the Saudi state is at the center of U.S. efforts to maintain the dollar as the world's reserve currency, and to ensure global demand for U.S. debt. The origins of this system go back decades. By 1974, the U.S. dollar was in a precarious position. In 1971, thanks to profligate spending on both war and domestic welfare programs, the U.S. could no longer maintain a set global price for gold in line with the Bretton Woods system established in 1944. The value of the dollar in relation to gold fell as the supply of dollars increased as a byproduct of growing deficit spending. Foreign governments and investors began to lose faith in the dollar, and both Switzerland and France demanded gold in exchange for dollars as stipulated by Bretton Woods. If this continued, though, U.S. gold holdings would soon be depleted. Moreover, the dollar was losing value against other currencies. In May of 1971, Germany left the Bretton Woods system and the dollar fell against the Deutsche Mark. In response to these developments, Nixon announced the U.S. would abandon the Bretton Woods system. The dollar began to float against other currencies. Not surprisingly, devaluing the dollar did not restore confidence in the dollar. Moreover, the U.S. had made no effort to rein in deficit spending. So the U.S. needed to continue to find ways to sell government debt without driving up interest rates. That is, the U.S. needed more buyers for its debt. Motivation for a fix grew even more after 1973 when the first oil shock further exacerbated the deficit-fueled price inflation Americans were enduring. But by 1974, the enormous flood of dollars from the U.S. into top oil exporter Saudi Arabia suggested a solution. That year, Nixon sent new U.S. Treasury Secretary William Simon to Saudi Arabia with a mission. As recounted by Andrea Wong at Bloomberg the goal was to neutralize crude oil as an economic weapon against the U.S. and find a way to persuade a hostile kingdom to finance America's widening deficit with its newfound petrodollar wealth. The basic framework was strikingly simple. The U.S. would buy oil from Saudi Arabia and provide the kingdom military aid and equipment. In return, the Saudis would plow billions of their petrodollar revenue back into treasuries and finance America's spending. From a public finance point of view, this appeared to be win-win. The Saudis would receive protection from geopolitical enemies, and the U.S. would get a new place to unload large amounts of government debt. Moreover, the Saudis could park their dollars in relatively safe and reliable investments in the United States. This became known as, petrodollar recycling. By spending on oil, the U.S., and other oil importers, who were now required to use dollars, was creating new demand for U.S. debt and U.S. dollars. This dollar agreement wasn't limited to Saudi Arabia either. Since Saudi Arabia dominated the organization of the petroleum exporting countries, OPEC, the dollar deal was extended to OPEC overall which meant the dollar became the preferred currency for oil purchases worldwide. This scheme assured the dollar's place as a currency of immense global importance. This was especially important during the 1970s and early 1980s. After all, up until the early 1980s, OPEC enjoyed 50% market share in the oil trade. Thanks to the second oil shock, however, much of the world began searching for a wide variety of ways to decrease dependency on oil. By the mid-1980s, OPEC's share had decreased to less than one-third. Today, Saudi Arabia ranks behind both Russia and the United States in terms of oil production. As of 2019, OPEC's share remains around 30%. This has lessened the role of the petrodollar compared to the heady days of the 1970s. But the importance of the petrodollar is certainly not destroyed. We can see the ongoing importance of the petrodollar in U.S. foreign policy which had continued to antagonize and threaten any major oil exporting state that moves toward ending its reliance on dollars. As noted by Matthew Hatfield in the Harvard Political Review, it is not likely a mere coincidence that especially belligerent U.S. foreign policy has been applied to the Iraqi, Libyan, and Iranian regimes. Hatfield writes, In 2000, Saddam Hussein, then president of Iraq, announced that Iraq was moving to sell its oil in euros instead of dollars. Following 9-11, the United States invaded Iraq, deposed Saddam Hussein, and converted Iraqi oil sales back to the U.S. dollar. This exact pattern was repeated with Muammar Gaddafi when he attempted to create a unified African currency backed by Libyan gold reserves to desell African oil. Shortly after his announcement, rebels armed by the U.S. government and allies overthrew the dictator and his regime. After his death, 
The idea that African oil would be sold on something other than the dollar quickly died out. Other regimes that have called for abandoning the petrodollar include Iran and Venezuela. The U.S. has called for regime change in both these countries. Oil exporters control U.S. assets. Threats can be leveled in both directions, however. Last year, for example, Saudi Arabia threatened to sell its oil in currencies other than the dollar, if Washington passes a bill exposing OPEC members to U.S. antitrust lawsuits. That is, the Saudi regime is aware that it has at least some leverage with the U.S. because of the Saudi position at the center of the petrodollar system. Saudi Arabia is one of few states that can even feign to call the U.S.'s bluff on matters such as these. As has been made abundantly clear by U.S. policy in recent decades, the U.S. is more than willing to invade foreign countries that run afoul of the petrodollar system. In the case of Saudi Arabia, however, the kingdom's position as an Iran antagonist, and as the world's third-largest oil exporter, means the U.S. is likely to avoid unnecessary conflict. Moreover, it is likely that Saudi holdings of U.S. debt and other assets are significant. When the Saudis make threats, this implicitly also includes liquidating the kingdom's holdings in the United States. As Bloomberg reported, Saudi Arabia has also warned it would start selling as much as $750 billion in treasuries and other assets if Congress passes a bill allowing the kingdom to be held liable in U.S. courts for the September 11 terrorist attacks. We often hear about how China and Japan hold a lot of U.S. debt, and therefore hold some leverage over the U.S. because of this. The problem here is that were foreigners to dump U.S. assets, they would drop in price. If U.S. debt drops in price, then that the debt must increase in yield, which means the U.S. must then pay more interest on its debt. But there is good reason to believe Saudi Arabia is a major holder as well. It is difficult, however, to keep track of how large these holdings are because the Saudi regime has worked closely with the U.S. regime to keep Saudi purchases of American assets secret. When the Treasury reports on foreign holders of U.S. debt, Saudi Arabia is folded in with several other nations to hide the precise nature of Saudi purchases. Nevertheless, as Wang contends, the Saudi regime is one of America's largest foreign creditors. The problem grows as U.S. debt grows. All else being equal, the U.S. should be growing less dependent on foreign holders of debt. This should especially be true of Saudi and OPEC-held debt since the global role of OPEC and the Saudis have been diminishing in terms of global share. But all else isn't equal and the U.S. has been piling on ever larger amounts of debt in recent years. In 2019 for example, the annual deficit topped $1 trillion. In a past less profligate age, this sort of debt creation would be reserved only for wartime or a period of economic depression. Today however, this immense growth in debt levels makes the U.S. regime more sensitive to changes in demand for U.S. debt, and this has made the U.S. regime ever more reliant on foreign demand for both U.S. debt and for U.S. dollars. That is, in order to avoid a crisis, the U.S. must ensure that interest rates remain low, and that foreigners want to acquire both U.S. dollars and U.S. debt. Were petrodollars and petrodollar recycling to disappear, this would have a two-fold effect on U.S. government finances. A sizable decline in petrodollar recycling would put significant upward pressure on interest rates. The result would be a budget crisis for the U.S. government as it had to devote ever larger amounts of the federal budget to payments on the debt. The other option would be to have the U.S.'s central bank monetize the debt by purchasing ever larger amounts of U.S. debt to make up for a lack of foreign demand. This would lead to growing price inflation. Moreover, if participants began to exit the petrodollar system and, say, sell oil in euros instead demand for dollars would drop, exacerbating any scenarios in which the central bank is monetizing the debt. This would also generally contribute to greater price inflation as fewer dollars are sucked out of the U.S. by foreign holders. The result could be ongoing declines in government spending on services, and growing price inflation. The U.S. regime's ability to finance its debt would decline significantly, and the U.S. would need to pull back on military commitments, pensions, and more. Either that, or keep spending at the same rate and face an inflationary spiral. This was the Atlantis Report. Please like share. Leave me a comment. Subscribe. And please take some time to subscribe to my backup channels, I do upload videos there too. You'll find the links in the description box. You will also find a PayPal link if you want to make a donation. Thank you wholeheartedly to all those of you who have already donated. Stay safe and healthy friends.